So, thanks for coming. So, today I'm going to talk to you about my PhD project titled The Geological Analog for the Future, uh, the Rapid Climatic Warming 56 Million Years Ago. As you can see from this uh, graphic in the background, the project uh, looks, uh, focuses on shallow marine environments and you can actually see a stark change before and after the, uh, the warming event in terms of what it um, did to shallow marine environments. So, what's the project motivation? So as one of several paleoclimate reference periods that was cited in the latest IPCC AR6 report, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or the PETM as I'll just call it from now on, 56 million years ago, provides one of the best geological analogues for investigating the potential impacts of future anthropogenic climate change. It's uh, characterised globally by this uh, quite characteristic uh, negative carbon isotope excursion, or CIE, um, which was also um, recorded at this shallow marine site by authors in 2016, which they associate with the PETM. So the aim of this project is going to be generating some novel foraminiferal uh, paleo paleoecological and paleo-temperature proxy data, which will hopefully significantly contribute towards understanding both the climatic and also the biotic responses to the PETM within shallow marine environments, specifically the Q section here. So what are the project objectives? So the first objective is to identify the dominant species of foraminifera, and that's both the planktic and the benthic populations. And by doing this, we hope to quantify the changes that are expected to span the onset duration and the recovery of the PETM at the Q section. And looking at other sites, we would expect this to cover several evolutionary and extinction events. The second primary objective is to reconstruct uh, sea surface and bottom water temperatures um, from the Q section using a multi-proxy approach um, based on primarily Delta 18 O stable isotopes of oxygen, uh, magnesium calcium trace element proxy, and clumped isotopes or CAP 47. Specifically, CAP 47 has uh, never actually been used yet to look at the PETM, so that will be quite interesting to do. Um, as you've seen maybe within the report, a lot of these methodologies are best applied to specific species of forams, um, and the report delves more into that why that is. Um, and this is really pretty much to allow any reproducibility of the results to be assessed. So, work to date on objective one. What's actually been done uh, in terms of forum work on the Q section? So interestingly, a number of authors have shown that an inverse correlation actually exists between the abundance of foraminifera at the Q section and the total organic carbon, or TOC, percentage. Um, specifically within this organic-rich saprophyllite uh, sap horizon. Um, and we can see this here quite well, that every time we have an uh, abundance of foraminifera, they seem to have a, this sort of inverse correlation when TOC goes up for um, abundance goes down, and vice versa. Um, so a, a, a few authors have suggested that the, this, this idea that the foraminifera at the Q section are responding to uh, pronounced what call them anoxia, so oxygen depleted conditions, and or eugenia, which is this very nasty hydrogen sulfide environment, um, which may account for this uh, quite stark um, protracted interval of potentially no forearms at the base of the saprophyllite um, that's been recorded by uh, subsequent authors. Despite all this, however, the abundance of uh, foraminifera has been known about at this particular site for more over 80 years, um, going all the way back to the initial work of Sabatina in the 1940s. Um, so surprisingly, there's not actually been any thorough taxonomic or paleoecological assessment of the site, um, the, even though it's obviously quite important for its um, association with the PETM. And this is something this project hopes to address. So. To do that, we've, uh, this is our kind of prel pre preliminary deep dive into looking at some of the foraminifera. So I'm going to base pretty much this on sample 723B, which is a, a sample that comes from the post-event period. 
and walk you through kind of like what we what we hope to do when we uh, go and examine these samples in terms of uh, the paleoecology. So, introduce the sample in question. So, sample two uh, two three B um, was used as a case study to investigate uh, what typically we we are hope what's in these samples really. So. Um, what's the grain and the foraminophil faunal composition of a random sample? So this, this sample was chosen at random to begin looking at, just to sort of see what, what, we, what we're dealing with. So we first put the sample through a, a splitter, um, for a micro splitter, and this was to, uh, main purpose of this was to reduce the sample down to a more smaller, more workable subsample, which was representative of the whole. And you can see there, we have our population of sample, um, and what we then do is we continue splitting down until we get to a, a, a population of sample that we estimate to be roughly 400 grains, and we'll come on to maybe caveats with this approach, but this is what we did, and then we put the sprinkle this out on our picking tray and literally count and record the composition of the different grains and the four grams present within the sample. However, this wasn't 400 grains, it turned out to be 12,018 uh, grains, which was significantly larger than we needed. And as a result, this particular method of going about doing things is probably quite uh, not that efficient, which we'll come on to uh, later on on how we could address that. However, we did generate some preliminary data from looking at this uh, sample in particular. So here we've got a pie chart showing the overall grain composition within this sample, this post-event sample, 723B. Um, what we can note from looking at this sample is that the foraminifera contribute approximately about a third of the overall sample, uh, and in particular the benthic foraminifera, that's the you know, the, the bottom-dwelling uh, foraminifera, they actually contribute three times as much compared to the plantics in this, in this analyzed sample. Also, there's a notable uh, amount of lithic fragments that are coming in at about 14%, which could suggest that the site in question at this time had some minor terrestrial influence. And although only making up approximately 3% of the overall sample, the presence of glauconite pellets may also suggest the site at this period in time was uh, deposited in close proximity to the fair weather or storm weather wave base, which some authors have used is a proxy for shallow marine environments. In terms of the foraminifera com uh, uh, faunal composition, um, the sample was actually dominated, 62%, uh, by the thick-shelled and dissolution-resistant calcareous benthic foraminifera. And this actually suggests that by this point in the section, um, potentially the benthic foraminifera communities have recovered from the, the abrupt warming event that we was spoken about at length within the report. The plantic foraminifera make about approximately a quarter of the overall assemblage and are actually dominated by the cold, uh, cold deeper dwelling subatinids, um, which is actually um, in agreement with other uh, post event sites. The subatinids, if you may remember, seem to kind of dominate after the, the warming event as the, the uh, kind of the paleoecology recovers from the abrupt warming and we have a depth stratification within a water column again to allow different sorts of uh, foraminifera to populate different depths. So what we actually saw within this one sample, uh, which is plate A1 within the, the figures in the report as well, is that we've revealed there's about 27 identified different taxa, um, ranging from uh, different uh, planktics and benthics. Uh, calcareous benthics and also agglutinate benthics as well. In particular, there's a high abundance of a particular benthic, calcareous benthic foram, uh, this spherical one here, number 14. And authors have actually suggested that this particular taxa is an indicator of shallow marine conditions dominated by wave action. Again, that might reinforce the kind of, you know, tentative preliminary interpretations that this is a very shallow marine site near the, 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 the storm and the fair water wave base. However, there is also the presence of the calcareous benthic foram Nuttalides trumpii, which is number 26 here. And authors have used this particular taxa to infer at least a minimum paleo depth of 600 meters. 
So again, going back to the, the, the report, there is some, there's still no one overall agreed paleo depth for this site. Is it potentially very shallow, neuritic, or is it potentially more bathial? It's maybe a bit more deeper. But it's a shelf site nonetheless, but its an exact depth is still requires further analysis to uh, figure out what exactly how deep it was. So going forward, what should we do to optimise the picking um, in terms of picking for the foraminifera? So after that initial example, we sat down and came up with a new idea about going about maximising the picking. So what we should do is, going forward, we should, when it comes to the first, uh, the first step of grain picking, we should initially split the sample down to 400 grains and count each the composition of that 400 grains. That may be planktics, benthics, lithics, fragments, what, what not. After that, we then, knowing the, the planktic uh, benthic ratio of the sample you've just picked, we then put that sample back in and into the bulk sample, re-split re the split. So you then have enough to have 300 planktic and benthics. So again, a lot of the time-consuming effort was almost sort of guesstimating how much sample you would need to have enough planktic and benthics for your analysis. By doing this approach, you already know the average overall ratio of your planktic and benthics in the sample because you've just counted it. So when you come to count the 300 you need of each different type of foram, you actually know that you will need, you know, maybe twice as much or three times as much by using the ratio you've just counted. After that, you undertake the foram picking, you pick out all your 300 planktics, your 300 benthics, and place them on separate si uh, slides. Only after that do you then go to those separate slides and perform your taxonomic analysis. And overall, this method should increase the efficiency of getting through the samples, rather than just picking a large population of grains and hoping for the, the, uh, the amounts of forams to be uh, representative of it. It seems in this particular site, the you know, lithics and other fragments are contributing quite a, a fair amount and might actually dilute the amount of samples. We might need actually a larger sample size to gain uh, as much plantics and benthics that we'll need for analysis. So how about the second objective then? So you're, a lot of you are probably familiar with this graph. Um, this is the kind of preliminary shallow marine uh, delta 18 0 stable isotope records from the Q section, which inter interestingly show there's no obvious uh, negative excursion. We sort of have high values before and during the event, and there's n nothing really sticking out. If you remember back to those first bulk um, records that show this pronounced negative excursion. And it's, they are, pr especially in the, the Paleocene, the sort of pre-event period, we're, we're quite characterised, but very, very negative Planktic and benthic uh, derived 18 0 values. And when you compare the, the, these records to, say, other pristine shallow marine records of the same period, which is quite unusual, um, so we need to think about what exactly is going on in these records. What could, they, what could uh, be the cause of this? So, again, by not actually showing a kind of characteristic PETM record that we would expect to see, it does limit our kind of acquisition or, or, of our goal to construct a robust paleo temperature estimate of this unique shell marine site. And alongside the, the absence of the other carbonate based paleo temperature proxies that we've mentioned like uh, magnesium, calcium and cat 47, also limits the procurement of this to pretty much get a more robust overall temperature estimate of the warming event. And this is something the project hopes to address as well. So what have we done? So we have decided to go and look at a particular tax of uh, for a planktic foram of Subatina, and we picked up the two most dominant Subatina species um, from existing uh, prepared samples and grouped them together into groups of 12, uh, composed of approximately 30 specimens. We then took these specimens down to the clean labs here at UA. We crushed them, uh, subjected them to a, a stringent uh, uh, cleaning procedure which removed any clays and organic matter, and that was to really um, ensure there's no contamination ahead of measuring them on the mass spectrometer. And then took it to the, uh, the scales and we measured the amount of material needed. And we were looking for each sample to weigh approximately between 50 and 120 micrograms, more so towards the heavier side. 
And then we uh, ran these initial subpoena delta 18 isotope analyses on the mass spectrometer here at UEA. So what did we find? What's the preliminary results? So when we actually compare these uh, subpoena, new subpoena results against the existing record of the same species, we initially went with the interpretation that maybe size of the uh, foraminifera is actually imposing some sort of vital effect onto the oxygen isotope measurements. Perhaps the extremely negative values are due to the size of the forams um, that have this effect on the um, oxygen-18 take-up when they're in, growing in their tests in their shells. However, we don't actually see much of a, a size uh, factor, but we do, uh, do see that a trend where the, the samples composed of a smaller number of individuals say, you know, a sample up with about 15 uh, specimens actually produce quite uh, more negative values than, say, a typical sample at maybe 30 or 40, um, which was quite interesting to see. So maybe there's something to do with the amount of calcium carbonate that we're producing, perhaps. Um, larger, yet larger samples uh, composed of medium to large foraminifera specimens are typically more in agreement with the pristine records um, seen for this event. Um, we can see here that some of these larger forams, approximately 40 and 30 specimens, plot within the sort of range that we would expect to see, and, and this is an upper range because the, these pristine records actually are from an equatorial site. So, you know, if there's anything above this that would suggest that the forams are recording temperatures warmer than at the paleo equator at this time, which is, you know, unlikely. So it's more likely to say that maybe a lot of these higher negative values could be potentially uh, biased by some uh, 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 delta 18 0 influence process, which the report actually stated a few, a few ideas it could have been. We also measured bulk isotopes, so that was that first graph on the, the first slide. Um, and the reason of doing this was to see is the, ex the magnitude of the uh, carbon and oxygen excursions at this site a result of more of the differences in uh, sample preparation between the laboratories between us and, say, uh, uh, the authors in 2016, and that might account for more extreme negative uh, bulk values. So to go about testing this, we took individual small fragments of the, the bulk sediment and ground it down to a homogenized powder. Um, we then, again, weighed those samples to ensure we had enough calcium carbonate in each sample, and then we measured it again on the stable isotope mass spectrometer within UEA. And this is our preliminary results. So on the left we have the uh, published record of the bulk uh, carbon, and we have here the, um, th this uh, record that we've produced here. Uh, and overall, so the aim was, again, to, to investigate if differences in preparation was to account for any variation within the magnitude of the signal at the site in question. It seems that by looking at these records, they seem to be in agreement, both capturing the, the large magnitude of the CIE in particular. However, some authors have also suggested that the remineralization of organic carbon within the saprophyllite horizon may also negatively bias the bulk carbon uh, values further. So perhaps the magnitude of the carbon excursion at Q is more pronounced because there's other um, influencing factors at play. When we look at the bulk oxygen isotopes for this um, and compare it to the published records, again, we can see that they're very similar. Uh, seem to, again, show this large negative excursion. Um, maximum value was negative 6.5. The values for the um, ne most negative values within the published record go up to 7.5. So they're quite very, very negative values, more negative than we would expect to see. So again, it suggests that potentially, especially within the saprophyllite horizon, there is some tentative evidence of uh, increased terrestrial input um, through riverine input. And again, changes in salinity is one example that may account for um, a potential negative bias within bulk records. If you compare the new bulk records to the existing um, stabilized for, uh, for manifold stable isotope data, um, again, both records do sort of show the same sorts of trends. So it's just that the primary environmental signals are preserved, if not somewhat altered. 
However, neither measurement is in agreement in terms of the range of values that we would expect to see from pristine samples from other locations. Again, we can see that both the uh, existing stable isotope record and the new bulk record are extremely negative values, far beyond what we would expect to see from um, a site that's at a lower latitude than this one. So again, suggesting influence from other uh, processes. Although, interestingly to see, the bulk 18 0 measurement pre-event uh, pre seemed to fall within the range of the average background measurements of um, foraminifera from uh, pristine samples from other sites. So potentially, it could infer that pre-event, the bulk samples are actually recording uh, maybe less altered, and perhaps we're seeing that there's pre-event foraminiferal samples are more, alt uh, more altered in some respect. And that might suggest that the, the foraminiferal samples pre-event, uh, why they're more negative might be a result of something to do specifically with that material. So again, is it the foram size or the number of foraminiferal specimens analyzed uh, contributing to this unusual negative, these un uh, unusual negative values? Again, when you compare the new bulk record with the new Sabatina records, again, it pretty much shows the same sorts of trends. Um, larger samples, again, are more in agreement with the more pristine records elsewhere, unlike the bulk, which shows very negative values during the, the main peak of the warming event. And equally, the pre-event uh, Sabatina values are also more negative, again, up here, um, whereas well, where we would expect them to be falling within here, um, suggesting again it could be a, a foraminiferal specific uh, issue uh, pre-event in terms of why why the sample so negative inferring. If we are to presume this is a true environmental signal, it would suggest extremely warm values, equivalent, uh, similar to the actual peak of the warming, which is unlikely. So, how about the future? Um, myth, uh, the future the strategy to go about measuring stable isotopes. Um, so what I propose is that, um, and again this is highlighted on the report as well, that um, all foraminiferal samples analysed should be both species and size fraction specific. And this is primarily to try and minimise any effect from the bifle effects that are shown to influence uh, delta 18 0 measurements. A new step that I think we should try and include is uh, the use of a uh, scanning electron microscope, which has been shown in other studies um, to be very useful in identifying the most pristine samples uh, analysed. Um, and it's been shown that even small amounts of secondary calcite precipitation on the tests of forams can actually significantly bias the delta 18 0 measurements. Clean lab methods should continue to be stringent and try and minimise as much con uh, contamination as possible. And when running for a mineral delta 18 0 in the mass spectrometer, we should be looking to have samples, uh, at least 30 specimens or more. Um, it's interesting to see that in the initial uh, delta 18 0 measurements, um, that the, a lot of the samples might have been as much as 15. So we need to maybe double or maybe treble as much, um, and also equivalent to at least over 80 micrograms. So we have enough material that's representative of the, the overall sample. And if we do all this, I think that would potentially decrease a lot of the uncertainty when it comes to the, the measurements produced. So sort of to conclude, um, within the next sort of like few years of the project, what's the kind of the main research focus um, for each, so, uh, each of the years? So as we've already mentioned, we've began to perform taxonomic evaluation on some of the existing foraminiferal samples and to identify and record the abundance of different plant embedded for and present, like in the example given. We've also begun to uh, pick out the dominant species like the Sabatina and begun to run uh, species-specific um, isotope analyses and compare that to existing records. Immediately going forward, I think the, the next step would be to begin training in the extraction and cleaning of the forams still present within the bulk sediments here at UAA and separate them into different size fractions. And also maybe uh, by the end of this year as well, starting to um, explore using the SCM, especially if we look at the, this particular figure, which is in the report as well, we can actually see there's a clear difference between a well-preserved forearm test, and then you can see it's very crystal re recrystallization on the outside of the secondary calcite, which has a different 
uh, isotopic composition. And therefore, if you measure that, you're actually biasing the sample. So SEM is a very powerful tool. It's been shown to have a, a better kind of uh, estimation of which samples should be prioritized over ones that might be uh, biased. In year two, hopefully we begin to start measuring more stable isotope measurement records. And they'll be, again, uh, species-specific records or uh, of particular planktics and benthics outlined in the uh, probationary review report. We would begin also to start to undertake the preliminary magnesium-calcium trace element ratios. That will be done here, or it could potentially be done with an additional collaborator, um, depending on the setup requirements needed. We've also got the clumped isotope Myra um, here, uh, exclusively here at UAA. And although, it, and this is explained in the report a lot more, that you know we still would require quite a lot of uh, a, a amount of material, anywhere between 1.5 and 4 milligrams. Um, but we, that, that's something that we'd hope to start to uh, investigate as well um, by the end, towards the end of the second year as well. And then by the end of the second year, hopefully have a, a prepared and written first manuscript uh, of one of our main objectives. And then the last year, um, hopefully by then, <laughs> yeah, producing uh, a new paleoecological record for the PTM, equivalent to other authors, we can see um, there's an example of what we could produce, different taxa, their abundance uh, and diversity across the interval in question. Uh, by this point, a more robust paleo temperature estimate of the PETM at this site might be produced, and this is explained further within the report, but there was the potential to integrate the different paleo temperature records to have a statistically more robust one, and this has actually been shown to be um, a more robust and uh, method to uh, calculate potential uh, magnitude of warming at a given site. And by this point, towards the end of the third year as well, you'd hope to be writing up and editing your thesis and preparing manuscripts for publication. And also, uh, during this time, if not wherever, throughout the next few years, also trying to showcase any project results at national and international conferences as well. And yep, yeah, so that's my references, and that's us. So, looking forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you.